So my talk is named Development with uh, Bicycles for Brains. And this Bicycles for Brains are, is any tool which makes a developer more efficient. And I would like to start with, with, some, with some higher level thoughts. Humans are very efficient when we use tools. And the most famous one is in Steve Jobs' board where he said computers are, develop, uh, are basically bicycles for brains because they expand our abilities to, to do stuff, but a bicycle cannot be uh, cannot be cannot ride without a human. So it's it's just a tool. It's just it's not a medical thing. It cannot replace a human, but it makes a human significant more efficient. And my mental model of software development is to use the right set of tools to to make a developer significantly more efficient over the time he has um, he can spend on a project. And uh, this outline I basically gave without showing the slide, so I will just skip it. Um, it just explains that I first want to go into the, the mental model of um, development tools and efficiency, and uh, then later go into live coding and mutant in particular. So it all starts from looking at the cost of software development. Software development is mostly determined by one thing and one thing only, unless you do uh, project which involves Oracle licenses, um, which means the most valuable part or input or resource of software development is human time. And human time has some really interesting properties. We cannot linear, linearly scale it up. Every developer knows that um, if, a, if a customer comes to you and asks like, oh, can you just spend two times a month of time or can we uh, double the, uh, the team size? Can we go twice as fast? And the answer is typically no. And this is just because humans Humans, uh, human time cannot be cannot be spent proportional in any ways. What we can instead do is to make sure that um, we provide the humans with the right processes, with the right tools to use their time most efficiently. And these tools and processes have basically two main properties. Um, when a developer is inside inside a time period where he can be productive, his production his productivity should be maximized. And if a developer is in the set of mind where he is unproductive, we need to make sure that the tools reject or the input because um, not every time period of a developer working on a project is actually has a net positive value. So each time you produce a bug which reaches production, that two hours, three hours, 10 hours are actually negatively affecting the software product. So my mental model is we need, we need to use the right set of tools to maximize our efficiency and also on the other end to make sure that there is a certain contribution threshold. If our contribution lies below the threshold, the processes and tools should catch it and prevent it and actually nullifying the work, which is much better to, than to have a negative contribution to reach the uh, production system. And um, yeah, um, as usual, I explain too much. So this slides goes into exactly what I just said before. So I will just skip it. Um, uh, the more technical solution is uh, for this higher level view of uh, producing tools which um, maximize the developer value is we need we need to make sure that on the on one hand we have constraints on what we deliver so we cannot just deliver anything and these constraints need to be automated because on we can just argue okay so we all practice tdd we have uh, we assume we have perfect we have perfect discipline and or uh, the other team members would check my discipline on code review to, to not to not violate any invariant. We all know this doesn't this doesn't actually happen because um, it's always it's like a Markov chain. So you lose all each each time you hand over work to yourself or to your co-workers, you lose some source and you 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 have the chance that a time period of not that good discipline affects the product negatively. So you have a, some kind of a propagation. And um, human discipline needs to be spent most efficiently. So we have systems which place constraints on the code. The most simple constraints in uh, Ruby is the syntax parser. So um, we could just we could just push the code to production without ever running the code uh, even through the uh, through the syntax checker. But the syntax is one of these constraints I'm talking about. And usually historically, Ruby has no other built-ins than the syntax. The syntax doesn't throw a syntax error, and we can require everything till the socket opens to a soft wrap. And naturally, the Ruby development community oh, at, at a certain moment in time identified, okay, so let's, let's write some unit tests to exercise the semantics of the code. This is a constraint. And now in 
And now in um, Ruby's Ruby 3, we even get more constraints, which can be which can help us to limit the lower bound of a contribution against something automatable. So we don't have to have to only rely on our co-workers to catch these um, uh, to catch these these kinds of discipline lapses. And so let's talk about okay, so same problem again. I basically uh, foreshadowed the slide, so I will just. I will probably skip every second slide. Okay, um, let's talk about test as constraints because this is where uh, I've personally had the most experience with because I wrote a tool in the space. Test as a constraints um, as constraints verify basically signify two things. So you have a lower bound of semantics ex, uh, semantics which are guaranteed to pass when your test is green. So you write a test with two thousand assertions or maybe zero assertions, but this sets a lower bound. Your project could do far more than the test asked for. And on the other hand, if a test fails, we, we know we, it's a hard stop. It basically falls below the contribution threshold. You can then negotiate with the team to, to put in a skip or a pending or whatever the project's, the project's uh, policy on these kinds of things is. But um, think, about, think about the value of test as a constraint as a lower bound. So I, talk, I already talked about that the developer's discipline is basically the uni is is the, is the, is the, or discipline cannot fall below what's enforced by a passing test suite without us noticing. And my argument is, what if we could use a tool to improve what is automatically enforced by test by another ten percent, by another fifty percent? And this is where mutant comes in. Mutant helps you to find cases where your code does more than the test asked for. And this is a really interesting property. And it um, in the future, when I integrate it, um, then we could also even ask for, OK, mutant would find more the semantics in your code, which tests and types do not ask for. So you can add more things to automatically um, reject this kind of findings. Like, hey, there's a type which prevents this kind of thing to happen, so we don't have to report it to the user. What I'm after here is. It's all about the mental model. There's a con uh, each project has a contribution threshold. Every time unit work by a developer, which falls below on, below the contribution threshold, is affecting the product value negatively. And each time the developer works above this contribution threshold, the project gains something from it. But the problem is here, nobody knows where the actual contribution threshold is, and nobody has we can only we can we only have confidence intervals. So the lowest, the lowest hard and fast one is the tests, the syntax, and the future is the types. But and the more tools we can add to, to perpetually raise this, the more likely it is that our contribution falls onto the positive spectrum. That's my mental model of development and also leadership in software development, and it turned out very well for me so far. OK, so um, the first attempt to improve upon just passing tests was simple line coverage. And um, simple line coverage basically only takes, like, takes into account, OK, what kind of what, which, which lines in our project were actually hit. And uh, fun fact, if you have a really good test suite and remove all the certs, the line coverage does not change. It's a, good, it's a good metric, but nothing to optimize for because it's so easy to cheat and it doesn't create really actionable CTAs. Um, uh, because let's assume you introduce uh, line coverage uh, to a project which has been running for five years, you will have like 70%, 80%, whatever. and there is nothing to be gained to go to the uncovered 20% because they had been in production without an issue for maybe five years. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really create this kind of urgency. And I rightfully, as I rightfully describe line coverage as the kind as, as typically some kind of, let's say, um, it's a seatbelt. So it helps, but uh, unless you drive safety, uh, a seatbelt will not protect you from anything. We have far more systems in the modern car, and I'm advocating to add more systems to the modern car, which help us to to raise this lower enforced contribution threshold. Okay, so uh, the other one is code reviews, and code review is basically just trying to use human discipline to raise us above what could be automatically verified. So a good code reviewer finds lots of things in your in, in a specific diff where he says like, hey, this one we do not really need or um, have to sort about that discount rule for our card and it seems to be violated here. So, and I'm, I'm repeating myself here and I really like to repeat myself, um, is each time a software developer uh, finds something high level in the code, 
where which wasn't automatically enforced as, as the review was spent right the time of software development which is most uh, most costly resource which is um was it was spent right and the uh, i lost my strain of thought give me a second okay and if we if we can spend the code review time more efficiently while removing by removing low level flex like okay so we have a redundant method call which doesn't change the outcome we have a redundant 2s here this is we we only we only pass in strings to this specific API. If we can remove all these cases via automatic tooling, then our code reviews become more efficient because we can have more time to spend on the higher level issues, which can not yet be enforced automatically, or maybe never be able to enforce till we have generalized AA. But when we have generalized AA, we may not even need developers anymore. Okay, so let's let's this is a kind of a code, this is kind of a representation of a could review a human could do or an automated tool which I'm proposing could do. This method foo does two things, does A and does do B. And your seriously skilled domain aware code um, co-worker could argue for, hey, if we remove this do A call, then our test still pass. But it's really important because that one sets up, um, loads some important database records into a cache do B will be using. Or that one um, sends the, um, Send the receipt to the customer. We really want to send the receipt to the customer on the checkout. And um, having a tool which allows you to, to do these kinds of very low level reviews, which are, in my opinion, not even human worthy, is the kind of um, bicycle for a developer's brain I'm advocating for to use. Okay. And um, Here's a slide for the people who never listened to the talk, where I just uh, put it into uh, put this kind of review so into into verbalization. I will just skip it. I would like to switch to the light left coding now. And what's really important for me is that you interrupt me because um, I may go too fast, I may go too slow, and I'm really used to have audience feedback, maybe one to one or one to five. And this is an experiment talk where I actually try to do live coding. Um, and unless I get interrupted and get re-steered, it will not work out. So please start to interrupt me as soon as you can. I've written a very simple application, which has um, one method. This one method has is just doing a very, a very small task. It counts the amount of strings in an array. And I would be glad if you could move these ones to real type signatures. But um, as I said, it's out of, uh, out of scope for this. Um, for this talk, and I wrote a test, and this test is is very weak, but it actually could, on a bad day, pass a review. So I, I go through the edge cases. I pass in an empty array. I expect that there are zero strings in there. I pass in in one string, and I expect there's one string there, and I pass in two strings, and I expect there are two strings there. And we all we. As experienced developers, we immediately notice there is not a case where we do not pass a string. And we're just basically counting the array items, not the array items, which are strings. And the problem here is easy to spot. But if you are in a real production environment, you do 10 code reviews a day, or you write 10 of, 10 of these methods a day, you will slip. And you will slip in fascinating ways. And the, you cannot just rely on your code, uh, on, your, on your peers or your own self when you put the code down and pick it up again to find these cases. And there is tooling available which can find these cases. So I just asked this mutation testing tool to verify that there are no extra semantics in the code other than the tests asked for. And a quick side note on types. This change passes the test. I can just return the uh, result passing the block. I can return the return value, which is returned by calling the count method on the input without passing the block. And this, this doesn't change the type. We pass in an array of something and we returned an integer. And this change doesn't change the type. We still return an integer. So this is the case types, at least at the granularity Ruby offers, will not help us at all. And this is the kind of thing a serious code review will find, but times human lossiness. And the, I'm advocating for to add these kinds of tools to your um, to your to your toolbox to scale to scale your own code reviews for your own code and for from the co-workers up. So let's go into the test and cover that one. So 
So we pass. Test pass now. We can ask the tool, is that one covered? Yes, but now another one shows up. And um, that one is uh, for, uh, for developers in Ruby, which spent significantly more time. Um, they know what's going on here because kind of also it evaluates to true in case we in case we pass in a subclass of string. But the tool knows, hey, do you actually this is the same question a code reviewer would ask? Do you only want to talk or only want to count instances of string or all instances of string and its subclasses? So this tool asks the kinds of questions a serious code reviewer would ask. And um, we can either refute or accept this, or let's say we accept it. We, we, we actually want to accept subclasses of string. And in that case, and we want, do not want to accept subclasses of string. So we go for, instead to kill the mutation or cover the mutation while adding a new test, we simply remove what the code does, which I advertised earlier. Each time we have a passing test, we only verify that the lower bound of semantics is matched. And tools like mutant allow you to verify that the upper bound of semantics is not significantly above what the test and what the test asks for. So we go to instance of, and now that mutation is covered, but another one shows up. That's an interesting one. So we could have said, yes, we pass in, we pass in items. So what we said in our test, we have a test for, we have a test for empty array, one string, two strings, and a non-string. The problem here is that we still didn't exhaustively specify that we only want to count strings because nil is, uh, is faulty. To actually prove to the tool we only want to talk, we only want to count strings, we have to, nil is faulty. Faulty, ever, uh, if false, if a faulty value is passed to the block, it's not counted. And false, the faulty value incidentally also wasn't the string. So your test still do not ask for the right behavior. Uh, test will fail. You have a typo in code. I have a typo in code, thank you. Thank you. So let's uh, just uh, uh, run the test for a second. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to run it. Test will pass, mutant says, I, you still accept false values here, but is it what you intend or not? No, it's not what you intend. We have to improve the test to actually Test still pass. And Newton finally doesn't have something to complain about. And the interesting point here is I did not, when I uh, extended the test case to cover the uh, non string case, I for myself in that situation into Ruby for nearly a decade forgot about the fact that nil is falsy. And maybe on a better day or maybe when I'm not nervous of presenting, I would have seen this initially. All I'm asking here about is to consider that we need to add something which reduces the wiggle room between test and code. And so far, I didn't get questions. And normally, I already had questions at that point in the demonstration. So I will move on and make the code more, make the, intentionally make the code do more uh, in the hope that we trigger some questions. So we pass uh, fully cover the original state. Now we go with, OK, what, what if? We want to make a method to um, uh, to count arbitrary types. No problem. We add an argument. I remove the documentation a bit from all this because I don't. So let's let's adapt the step. Let's adapt the test. Pass. There is no automatically to be found wiggle room. But now, think about what we just did. We changed the uh, message signature. And in Ruby, 
because we typically or historically do not have um, do not have um, really good coverage, we, we try to avoid breakage. So what we typically do is we default to the previous case. So we add a default. The funny part is now that mutant rightfully would complain uh, that there is no specification of the default case because our tests actually only ever only ever have been run with strings. Uh, uh, only ever have been have been asking for the cases where the second parameter is not defaulting. So what we need to do is we need to we need to prove this entire thing. We could we could normally like go with a shared context and so on to, to reuse, but let's go with um, let's go with something quicker. Normally, I have a second console open with file watching and everything, but for demonstration purposes and, and actually time um, space in, in screen sharing, I'm, I'm foregoing that one. So now we ask the tool again, and the interesting point is that I still ask, I, I still get uh, get my ass handed to me because yes, now I provided the case where we do not actually pass in the string, we pass in something else, so we cannot replace it with nil anymore, but I still never provided the case where we use the default. So what we actually need to do is to create a case where we use the default type. on code review you have uh, asked uh, your method or named by the way because sorry? it's still named at this point on yeah yes the... obviously yeah so I, I sorry for um for normally i would have asked for it to be renamed so i that's actually we can actually do that real quick so let's ask Next time I do this, I will uh, split screen and run the file watch on the other side, so I don't have to manually execute. Okay, and now we are back at full coverage. And what what I'm after here is there is a high chance that you as the author would have forgotten to cover a case, and there is a high chance that the reviewer would have forgotten to cover a case, and there is an even higher chance that the uncovered case went into production by its own it wouldn't probably not be a problem but if you multiply if you span this out over two years development cycle you end up with these uh, cases where where you have um somebody somebody even changing the default and there was no coverage to ever to ever uh, verify the default and you will find it uh, three weeks later when you will notice that your discount calculations have been off for a week or so and yeah that's the first part of the demonstration. And the interesting problem for me now is I've received zero feedback, but you made a typo. And I would really invite to ask questions because uh, as I said, I will just keep going and make it more complex in the hope I trigger a question so I can go into some of the details here. Okay, so we finished adding the uh, default parameter. The next step uh, would, uh, would be to accept an array of types because it's for some reason
let's see what's going on. Yep, I didn't bring anything muscle, but I assumed I would have ruined it. No worries. I still pass in. It's one case where I don't pass in. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so we are now we are now down to uh, we are we are counting the um, occurrences of a user provided type list. So you can ask for hey, um, how many strings and objects are in that uh, are in that in that array? Okay, so now we are back to things we might have forgotten. And the interesting uh, an interesting case is the tool knows the semantics of error of any and all. And so far we have only passed in one element arrays and we need to provide a test case where um, to prove to the tool that or to our reviewer that we actually meant to to cover more than one target types. Let's do it. So we have extend. We have asked for two. Uh, for we have now we actually we run the tool. We run the code with providing an array of two target types. But we have never evaluated, ever never expressed to or test that we actually only want to cover cover a specific uh, entrance of entry of the type because we never match any any of the items against the target types. So what we have to do is to actually. we actually elaborated the difference between any and all. And so on and so forth. The overall idea is that on each iteration, you can ask a tool, did I actually ask my test? My code does more than the test asked for. And what I just did is basically inverse TDD. Instead of just making up the cases and then implement the code, I implemented the code and then asked the tool which cases I have to cover. And uh, you can play it any um, in any iteration you want. So I've got I've got teams which do traditional TDD and close it up with mutation testing. I've got people who do code first, use mutation testing, and then close up, um, close up um, with, with TDD. The interesting point here is this is not a good test structure-wise. So there is, I, if if I were to do this, I would probably I would probably have it more structured. I would use some shared um, I would use some shared examples. And this neatly demonstrates that mutation testing is not a silver bullet. And these kinds of tools cannot replace a developer who is trained to write proper tests and understandable tests. All it can do is to highlight the semantic wiggle room and ask the developer to rethink what he just did, equivalent to what a professional code reviewer on his best would ask for. And um, the tool never has a bad day. Is there, I'm, I'm really surprised I've not received any questions. I've not received any complaints about going too fast. So. Um, in a real talk or in a real workshop, I typically ask people, uh, my, my strategy in that situation is to just point to someone and ask him questions about what he understood or if he could repass some of, repass some of my statements to get the information exchange flowing. But here I'm not really sure on how to proceed. So is there anyone who maybe has constructive criticism? I, I love being challenged like, but this tool doesn't do that, whatever. I have a question related to types. So it's pretty good with inputs uh, as simple types, but how good is it with factories, which are the objects of some kind of an you know, RAM like SQL or Active Record? Uh, is it possible to mutate their attributes? When so, so the thing here is, it's mutation testing doesn't act, doesn't change the input. It changes how your code reacts to the input 
to force the developer to be exhaustive in his specification. So let's say we you would write code like this. Uh, uh, and then you have some kind of body, you render email from the order, and then you, you, you send it like, uh, I'm just making up APIs, do not take this one for granted. And you would, you would want to write a test for this. And you, what, you, what you would do, you would somehow capture the interaction with this global object and ask for that a specific body was set. And now it depends on application design on how you proceed to make sure that your factories are covered. And it could be that you have a separate render email function and you have a dedicated spec for that. And it, uh, this specification goes through the cases uh, where you say, okay, so, um, if there is a discounted item, we add a section explaining the discount. And if that code is here, so let's say we have that one. Let's make something really And now the tool would force you to, to, to actually give it a discounted case. But it wouldn't go in and change the attributes by itself because it's a semantic coverage tool. It doesn't cover your inputs. It would be a fuzzer. So these tools are autonomous to each other. I hope I made my point. Even? Makes sense. Thank you. OK, perfect. And uh, let's go into into some detail, which I, um, normally I, I would, uh, in this kind of nesting, I would prefer uh, if I write the code, I start to, I start to refactor stuff like, uh, in, And that method here, let's make it private. And uh, this way it's a little bit more cleaner. You can add a little bit of documentation if you wish so. And the interesting point here, you are not supposed, because it's a private method, to have any kind of test for that method. But it's still covered as these kinds of tools like Mutant do realize that this count types function is using any type and any type is private. So all the questions which could be asked on the any type method have to be answered via the test or of the count types method. So if you if you run that right now, you, you still get full coverage. And even if you just target and even if you just target this specific method, it's still fully covered because it realizes the relationship between test on a public method versus the public method using the private class. So um, what typically happens if you use these kinds of tools, these kinds of constraint enforcing tools where you, uh, which enforce that you only ever code what your test asks for, is that you end up with few public methods which have a good amount of logic hidden behind them. So it, uh, it creates some interesting back pressure on API design also. That was actually the next iteration I wanted to demonstrate. By the way, right. question, uh, what uh, regarding uh, meta programming? So for example, if uh, you effectively have a class in, instead of model and uh, pass uh, some uh, params on initialization like dependency injection. And so, uh, yeah, sure, let's, let's, do, let's do an example. So um, I, I now realize I should probably have prepared to switch the live coding session over to a Rails example because that would answer many of these questions before, but I hesitated to do so because I've not checked it ahead of time and it would probably just be a, a very noisy to the audience because I, I would I would under the emotional pressure of having an anonymous audience probably probably not do a good job. But let's let's do an example. 
Uh, actually, you shouldn't be so nervous because uh, this audience consists mostly of senior developers and they are okay. familiar with concepts you are sharing. Okay, that's great. So I, that's also probably something I should have uh, anticipated and up the stakes here because there's much more to talk about. We can talk about concurrency isolation. Um, we can talk about um, advanced test selection hoops and so on. So uh, that's exactly why I asked for feedback. So if you want me to try to change to the right example, should we do that? Well, probably, yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it, it will go. be quite interesting. Okay, no worries. Mm, da, 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 da. Let's, let's see where I left it. So this is a Solidus fork I made like two years ago. Okay, let's see if it still bundles. So this is normally um, from a workshop. So this workshop has some interesting constraints because I do not want people to mess around with a local database. So it still uses SQLite. And because it uses still SQLite, it, it's meant that uh, concurrency is disabled. And this means that the mutations per second you get are really slow. It's still much faster than a human review. But uh, just as a word of warning that this is not representative for um, using it on a commercial rights application because there you, had, you would test against real databases and real databases have concurrency where you get uh, almost linear speed up with the number of cores you can dedicate. I say almost linear because um, Mutant is implemented in Ruby and Ruby's the main process doesn't scale above 13, 13 cores or so. Working on uh, GAMLIST, I noticed a uh, muted license, which uh, means uh, that uh, there is a commercial version. Uh, <laughs> it's even funnier, it is only the commercial version. So okay. um, the, the problem I had is that I was almost exiting Ruby. But I had this tool, and it was in the open source. What it was, what it was dormant, and I needed to, I needed to make sure I do not fall into the trap of um, dedicating significant amounts of time on just doing open source, which gives you lots of dopamine, but uh, can drive you into really bad financial situations, which happened to some of my peers. So my solution was to um, basically buy out the external contributors I had, as I have written like ninety-seven percent of the code. It wasn't too, too much a problem and um, have them sign a retroactive CLA and re-release the tool with proper support and lots of bug fixes. And it makes a sizable amount of my income. I cannot live from it, but at least it's not dead. And otherwise I would have been dead entirely. And it's still free to use for, uh, for source projects. And if you ever wanted to try by yourself, um, I recommend to just show up in my Discord, give me the URL of your open source project and have me do the initial PR where I set up the tool, where I, uh, uh, give uh, run the tool for you for 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 a specific class explain what's going on and then we can start in, uh, a little bit of a discussion so you can start to use the tool on your own where you on your own code you can react to the tool and later on you may decide to put it on your side in blocking mode or even just in observation mode whatever so there's ah. um there's uh, this is a, this is the best path to just start to use it on any open source and once you are familiar with it you know the you know on how to react you get a little but, bit of uh, a must uh, right now, I'm asking about quite opposite thing because uh, I'm looking for something tool like this to automate code reviews for commercial project I'm working yes, on. Yes, uh, there is a commercial license, but I recommend to start with an open source one because that way you can talk to me without any NDA stuff and so on. And this is the big, biggest adoption issue. The tool is was written mostly by myself for like 10 people I work with directly every day. So it has bad on ramps. I'm about to fix this, but I have to balance this with earning living money. So um, and it's I, I prefer to interact with people for like half a week on open source and then give them a trial license and then they can do it on commercial. But if you try by yourself without my help at the current state of the code, just because it's it was made to be intentionally hostile, it has it has 100% coverage hard coded in. You cannot even change the lower the coverage expectations. You should use a different strategy with excludes, but it 
currently needs to be explained and I don't have the documentation out there to make yourself level up. It's much better to start with a small open source project, get, get a demo, get a hands-on, do a one hour one-to-one -one with me, and then you can, I'm totally fine to send, off, send you off to a commercial project where you could use it. But every sale I tried where I give someone who has no previous experience to Mutish, to Mutant, gave him a trial license and uh, he or she would come back and bounce off the tool. So in every sale, I got someone to sit down with me for 60 minutes, one-to-one, -one, um, I have an 80% conversion rate for a commercial sale. So I, I, need to, I need to stick to the evidence instead of uh, doing the traditional stuff like, yes, just use it on your tool, on your commercial tool. Once I had more time to make a little bit better auto detection, to, get, to uh, make a primary rates integration so it auto detects certain things, um, then I can change this route. So let's let's do some uh, let's do some uh, mutation testing on a Ruby code base. So I've I've scouted that um, code base before, and um, I've written down I've written down um, subjects. Subjects is mutant speak for things that can be mutated, which have some interesting behavior. And the problem here is this is not the average case of using the tool. Normally, you use the tool on the code which has just been written by your coworker or yourself. So you are very interested to fix all the holes the tool shows. This mode here is retroactively where we peek into code, which is very likely correct because the Redus has lots of production use, but has weak specification. So it's not showing, it's not putting you into the right mental mode. Yeah, normally you would just use it on uh, to review code you just have written, your coworker has written, or your company has written which for a feature. And everybody knows what's going on with the feature. Everybody has the constraints in mind. Everybody's really interested to squeeze everything out. But um, is there any kind of subject which where you think, hey, this is something I would really like to see because I've got a mental model of what, what's going on here? Uh, well, quite interesting two uh, things. It's uh, unspecified delete and read restrictions. Okay, that's a fun one. Let's go with it. Uh, so I'm not. Uh, I, there is a command you have to run before to set up the. Uh, just know that I, I forgot to. Um, I need. Uh, I, I know that we need to set up the test at first. Okay. Now it's set up because the test implicitly set it up before. Okay, let's try. Just see if it starts. I will switch to the code before we look at the mutations. Okay, it starts. Perfect. Okay, so what's uh, let me just reformat it for a second so we can read it in this kind of screen sharing format. Okay, so we have the, uh, there's a user relation. Actually, it's not a user relation, it's a, a dependency injected model, which uh, some it's a perfect example you choose. Um, so you have this message is supposed to delete the payment source, a specific payment source out of a user's wallet. It traverses, it accesses the wallet payment sources relationship. It finds a specific payment source uh, while raising exceptions, which is an interesting design decision. Um, and it calls destroyer on the payment source. Uh, it's not really interesting. It uh, happens everywhere in Spree. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, so just a little bit of uh, small talk for us. I spent seven years to rewrite Spree in my previous job. So we, we were three developers <laughs> on a, on a okay, really big e-commerce. Yeah, actually, um, I have a tweet out there. So we uh, we started with, I think it was 300,000 lines of Ruby. And at the end, it was 80,000 lines of Ruby, um, 10,000 lines of Haskell, and 20,000 lines of SQL. Because we pushed most of the logic to the database. It's a totally different topic, a talk I wish to give, but I suck at talk, so. Hey. Um, what I can tell from memory, that that one here is entirely unspecified. So if I remove that, fi uh, that find by constraint, um, the test still pass. And Newton shows you. And let's run oh, Newton to, to show you. So, and the takeaway is typically not to exhaustively specify it, but to use a correct 
resource controller class, which um, which handles these things generically, so you only specify it once. But um, during the workshop, I typically, I typically, um, you see, it's very low mutations per second, just because this code base is entirely unoptimized. Um, so the test selection is weak. The test setup is done um, is done per mutation, where you normally would lift it to the master process, and they're really small changes. But I intentionally left it like so. You could later. I will link to the uh, repository. It's public. It's for minimal setup, and the demonstration is typically explicitly meant for. Hey, you only have to do like five five lines, and you get this kind of review, and it's automated. So even if that producing that result took like uh, ninety seconds real time, it's much faster than a code review. To ask your coworker to look over it if you forgot the case, exactly. And uh, what it it actually shows you what I what I described earlier. The test still pass even if I remove the constraint for the payment source. And the solution is to set up, if you if you do database infected testing, which I normally do not do, but if you want to stay with typically AR database touching tests, you would have to set, set up two payment sources, make sure that the order is halfway deterministic, and, and then- Proper was deleted. Exactly, but this is not the way I would test this method because, um, uh, this is a standard example. I do not want to test that active record is implemented correctly. I want to test that my call site to active record is implemented correctly, which is an interesting distinction. I also do not want to test that PostgreSQL executes the delete correctly. I want to test that I actually deleted the payment method I wanted to delete. And it stays that payment method and not, uh, there's no semantic riddle room. And active record makes it super hard. So even in commercial projects, I often resort to this kinds of set up a deliberate uh, DB structure and make sure a specific one got deleted. Let's look at the test for a second. Uh, I've models, yeah. I've not done rates for a while. Uh, three, lop. Yeah, I'm already in the namespace wallet, right. exactly. Yeah, so, and that's, that's a typical thing. We have two tests. Let's say let's check where the delete is. I actually could have asked Mutant because Mutant knows already, but I've not upgraded Mutant to the version which it tells you where the tests are. So um, this is basically what you see here is six months old Mutant. It's not there. What am I doing here? I'm confusing my audience. Actually, it's great to not see 50 people and only have one person to talk to and everybody listens in. I have not. So, okay, so I'm just reformatting it so we can read it. So it's very likely that we actually um, rescues this record and transforms it into a user interaction. So it rescues this exception and transforms it into a user interaction. I've not, I have no mental model anymore for the control flow here. But as you see, there is a subject setup. We remove a credit card and it checks, it does a very weak check because I think it only, only checks the count to change. Exactly, yeah. It only checks this account, as, as this, as this, is a, this is almost no assert because it wasn't specified which one to remove. And this is basically what Mutant showed you. Um, we could try to fix it um, and the it would probably go like this, create multiple credit cards. So it's simplest, but not uh, not one way possible. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you? Uh, I, I mean, uh, so we are checking, uh, we're creating two credit cards and doing all the stuff database operation, but so it's simply avoidable actually. We can just uh, give we, a spy. Could, let's, do, let's do that one. We, we, could, we could do a spy and uh, a spy would probably Given this entire setup be one way to, to, to handle that situation correctly, but I would recommend that if you ever run into the situation, you remove one adjacent record from a parent record, that you have some kind of a resource controller which abstracts this thing, so you don't have to respecify it for every little model. Which is which just would be very exhausting unless you attach some extra domain logic, like okay, so remove a credit card from a from a from a from a user and you would like to send him a confirmation email then you cannot use a generic record controller but what? maybe you you would add then add a hook to so this entire like callbacks sorry 
no, 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 no hooks in that, uh, not hook in that sense. You would probably make a real service object and handle this on a real yeah. domain layer. I would not okay. recommend to go into, uh, into, into it's a snake pit, the kinds of um, active record callbacks. Um, I think that, that, and sometimes, sometimes it's even, especially if you deal with legacy code bases, like code spree as a very legacy code base, it sometimes doesn't even make sense to go for 100% coverage. It's just more a way, okay, so we acknowledge we don't specify that specific property. I would probably, if some of my team member had to touch this method, it shows up, I would accept that he at least changed this expectation to make sure the credit card we set up above here was deleted. So, and then whitelist for whitelist uh, first limitations, which enforce that um, the other one is it really, so I'm not advocating for deleting for, for covering 100% of all mutants, especially when you touch legacy code, just use the feedback to make it a little bit better, or at least to be aware of what to manually check because the tool just taught you, you can, you can delete every, it could, you could change the code to delete any method, literally any, any credit card from any payment source. This is and, especially uh, valuable in case when a team is big and they are working in the same code base, not yes. split it over different projects because uh, you can't maintain everything. Exactly, exactly. So um, I would argue that instead to cover that one and uh, covering that one, I, I, I know for a fact we need, to, we need to fix a lot of things because the factories are not really idempotent and so on and so forth. I would argue we go to another case where um, I show you the subject list again and we talk about the, uh, how to interpret their live mutation on what equivalent code review comment it would yield because the tool doesn't formulate it in human language, it formulates it in diffs. Is that okay for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely actually because it's uh, pretty understandable for you. Go back to the subjects. Um, so there are cases where there are no specs at all, lots of them. And many of these cases are actually where you actually should make the method private and reuse tests of other methods. So um, um, mutation testing also, if constantly applied, leads to lots of back pressure to make very narrow public APIs for a specific class and not have this giant um, have this giant blob of um, public methods lying around waiting to be at a problem. Um, and Spree, once again, it prefers to have a, a big public API. More yes, than yes. Usable. So, yeah. So, it's not, um, that's what I said. So, the problem with Spree as a workshop target, I choose it because many people know it. And, uh, but the code people write typically, or at least the teams I interface with, is a little bit more stringent and it's more straightforward to explain. So it's, I had to do a trade-off here. Um, probably I should find a public Rails project. Like, actually, uh, let's go to Rails event source next time because they, they do a stellar job in covering and we could cope, could go back to some features they recently merged and then remove uh, remove some specs they wrote and then we can talk. I'm still learning my feedback to do this stuff because normally I never give these kinds of presentations. I do one-on-one -on -one code trainings. Okay, somebody spots somebody spots um, a subject we should go with. Uh, sorry, uh, under specified payment related code. Yes, let's go for that one. The money class is giant. Uh, it, it, it's a really bit confusing here <laughs> because uh, uh, normally tests shouldn't take care of uh, payments. I mean. I think it could also just be um, what I think is I did a mistake and uh, copied that one down. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's very lucky that that is the correct one. It's very lucky. So we st you still want to go there? Uh, yeah, it's it's still okay. interesting. Sure. Uh, I forgot where the class is. Um, uh, and just a question from a chat so while you're searching, sure. uh, do you use mutant on mutant itself? Exactly. Yes, I do. And it's, uh, it has a really funny mode. It's called the zombie. And the main problem is if I mutate the code, which, if, which checks if a specific mutation is covered, that mutation could come back as uncovered while it's covered because the logic is turned around. 
To prevent this, I wrote a dynamic in-memory renderer, which hijacks all requires, loads mutant twice the original one, and one in the so-called zombie namespace, executes the zombie against the original one to be able to measure the effect without, measure, without changing the code which measures the effect. Basically, well. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit of nasty code, but I think uh, that code is also, if I mutation test, so it's funny, if I mutation test the code, which helps mutant to cover itself, MRI crashes. So basically, the, that's the abstraction level I can go right now. So the only part of mutant which is intentionally uncovered is that part which makes mutant be able to cover itself. The reminder, all code changes in mutant are always 100% covered, but only the changes. I typically rarely go back and uh, retest stuff which I'm not actively working on. Um, I probably should because it's a little bit of a flagship project, but um, uh, time, time value-wise, it's much better to just run the tools on the code you actually changed instead of going for a two-hour two run to get all the mutations, which is just producing uh, like like a line coverage. So everybody knows, yes, we have 80% line coverage. Yeah, nice. What do we do about it? Not because we, we do not touch this code right now. It's, it's uh, mutation testing is more about creating action levels in your current code change. And let, let me just show, uh, just elaborate one important thing. Mutant has a since flag. So you, you run mutant like that typically, and you can give it any Git reference, like master, main, whatever, and it would automatically only target the subjects, which is mutant speak for addressable for mutation, te uh, mutation testing pieces of code um, that were touched in your current branch or whatever reference you choose. You can choose also the privilege commit if you wanted to. And this way you don't have to manually track and you can just run the tool in a loop and let, let it auto select um, which things you had, um, had touched. I so already it's... know a command for my CI. Yes. Uh, and uh, if you wanted to, it's exactly that one, what you should do. So, and if you, my teams, we push each commit individually to get a full build per commit. So we use since had one, but um, on other teams, we, that do a slow start, you have more like a since master, since main, or what, whatever you want. It takes any Git reference. Better do not do the root commit, but other than that, it's fine. Um, okay, let's go into one. I do not know what the time is. Uh, have you overrun the time yet? Because I'm in the conversational style, I actually can present. And I have no mental model of time passing. Well, a little bit, but let's take a look. I'm fine to keep going. I love this stuff. Okay, so um, let's go with that monster. Initialize. Oh. What can possibly go wrong in the core class of, uh, of an e-commerce domain? I see no replies. Let's go for... Let's go for two hard, uh, two HTML. That's that's small. So and these uh, warnings are not mutant related. It's just uh, speed itself. So let's check. Uh, almost everything comes back. No, almost nothing comes back. It's, uh, it's one alive. Perfect. Okay, let's check. I have no memory of that one. Uh, uh, syntax yeah. error. It's very funny because we just I created a syntax error in the spec. So let's review it. By the way, I do these kinds of demos for free but because you pay me in your questions because I need to learn to, to explain mutation testing on the job much better. And the more feedback I get, the more questions I get, the better my messaging messaging gets. And if anyone wants to do this with me on a pairing, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, two hours, I typically forget the time, feel free to show up in my inbox. Okay, so let's scroll up. Yep. So what do we have here? That's an interesting one. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> one. Exactly. And this is the kind of stuff which is really helpful if you get it on the code you are actively working on. Because that's the stuff you do not always see on a code review. And the next step is to check the test selection because it might have been the case that the test which covers that specific call um, was just not selected. 
So what you can do is you can uh, mutant prints all the tests which were selected here. So it is selected a lot because there's no dedicated spec for two HTML. So these are the identifiers of the spec of the test mutant selected to try to cover this mutation. The selection looks good, but let's look at the test. Um, we have a direct specification uh, for mass HTML with currency. Yeah, it's a very good typical spread. So, but it doesn't at all specify the HTML safety desk. There's nothing. Let's, let's check for other call sites. Yeah, only two call sites. And to cover that one, you would probably just go in and ask for the property it was marked as HTML safe. That, that's one way to cover it. Or you realize that it's probably a mistake to, um, to, 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 uh, to mark it as HTML safe. As again, I need to, I need to, I need to emphasize here: mutation testing is not about 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 finding code which needs to be specified. It can also lead you to code which shouldn't exist. And in DAO, I would actually not declare a string as, as HTML safe, but very likely it's intentionally very likely say they actually meant it to be HTML safe because they are constructing a tag. Yeah, that entire thing is looks very shady to me. They actually not that much. Yeah, okay, I, I could I could subscribe to make this HTML. So I, would, I would have to think outside of uh, being much better thousands of people. Um, it's an interesting idea why uh, why they just replacing spaces with non breakable space. Mm -hmm. I'm not really happy with that solution at all because normally it would be far easier to just um, wrap this entire thing in a tag and use CSS to make uh, to use that instead of this is like this is encoding encoding layout on the wrong level but could have been for older browsers so who knows I'm not a front-end person I would confer with my front-end person for that one you're just um, not, not in the trends of uh, the new new front-end because uh, they don't like to use CSS now they don't like to use real HTML. Now they they like to use probably the... probably I was too much I was too much fixing concurrent transactions and distributed transactions to 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 notice. So I noticed that I mostly write JSON APIs these days and uh, don't care about what's happened, what kind of code sloshes exist at the front end anymore. So I'm I specialize in writing concurrency hard systems. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, I cannot talk about most of my clients, but it's it's stuff where let's say if you if you get one percent wrong on average, you have a big problem, and uh, this is this is where mutant was born because I, for some reason we had to do this in Ruby. Ruby is not my primary choice for 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 hard correct systems, but mutant was evolved from the need to have a little bit of higher automated coverage so we can. We can spend our human time on something important than to verify if the nil is propagated or not. And um, yeah, so we could try to cover that one. Um, I forgot the API. If someone can post it, I would have to lock it up on. I'm not sure if that one passes actually. Let's try. It's a very so it's not how I would write the spec for our review. It's just just to make it, just to to move to the next subject. Yeah, now let's ask Newton again. And very likely this call cannot be removed. Yeah, it's it, it's correct API, so it was marked as HTML safe. Exactly. So um, and the point here is, uh, and now the thing is, I, I run this tool right now in uh, in this one is not being run in fail fast. I'm not sure. So um, it could be that still. Uh, that the call can still be removed because the output was marked as HTML safe before and the entire, core, the entire call to HTML safe was redundant. Let's check. Uh, it, yeah, now it's, uh, now it's off to this entire, this entire conditional if there are HTML options are not, uh, can be removed. So the tool moved on to the next one. And um, it's, it's really, I, I can just repeat myself at that point, or we move to the next uh, the next subject because this is the best way to teach people about this kinds of automated code review. 
Anyone ready to the next chapter subject or do you want me to cover that one also? Because we just have to prove that we can, uh, we just have to prove I, I that. Enough. I have Sorry? a general question about the tool. Sure. Is it supposed to be uh, run manually or as a part of uh, CI pipeline? Uh, I'm asking because- To be of both. So depending on your project's policies. So um, even if I'm on a project where I cannot use it on CI because it's not accepted by all developers, I use it for myself. I use it locally. And this is the biggest growth vector because I have people working for companies with big names and they just pay me for the private money to get a license for the company email address. And this basically means they are using the tool to review their own code or review their co-workers code without telling on how they export all this stuff. It's fine by me, so I'm happy to take the money. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, you can, also in the ideal mode, for me personally, you use it on CI and locally, and you have a good policy to escalate because sometimes it's really hard to cover something just because you're building on top of some external sand, like active record. There are some ugly cases there just because the way you have to test mm -hmm. active record call sites. And sometimes it's fine to whitelist the imitation, but then there should be some kind of uh, process like I typically do like, okay, so if you want to whitelist the imitation, uh, we have a budget of one whitelist per 100 lines. And if you want to add, if you want to, to add, uh, add something, remove something else. So it, it really depends on the maturity of the team, on the, on the, on the rigidity of the, of the governance and so on. But in the end, um, I typically end up either the team drops the tool or it runs on CI in blocking mode. It's a, what I noticed, it, it took a lot of time to actually refactor the first example that you shown uh, because yeah, it was a one simple method with three lines and the tool suggested uh, about seven or eight different changes and it didn't show them uh, all at once. We it, it normally would show them all at once. This is just for the, this is just for demonstration purposes. I have it at fail fast mode. Oh, okay. So we don't we don't get overwhelmed, and the next uh, the next UI iteration is um, there is a tree internally. So if you if you look at that if statement here, you have if that if statement can be entirely removed, then it might not make sense to recurse to mutate the check at all. So the next step is a feature I call dependent mutations, where it would show you the mutation, it skipped just because the parent was already uncovered. And it would, um, especially when I finally get the time to do the GitHub integration, it would only show you the most cost grained mutation and with a link to see all the other ones. So it, it, the, the key is here to, to reduce the, to reduce, to get, it's, it's like if your first boxing lesson is with Klitschko, it's a bad idea. And, um, and that's, that's happening here with the, with the, with the tool. So right now it, without fail fast, it would just print everything which is great for me because I'm a power user of the tool and I, over the years, see, already see patterns and I can probably kill 20 at one because I just go to the most narrow case immediately. But uh, to make it more approachable, I really want to change it to, you get the most cost grained one. And if you look at the details, you go to more fine grained ones. It's a and little locally, expensive for the CI because sometimes it takes for half an hour to actually finish. And if you make changes one by one, uh, yes, actually, but they, some you have to, you have to realize faster. that Mutation testing doesn't run the whole test suite. So um, for, for this money class, we only run the money tests. And for the wallet class, we only run the wallet tests. And let's say your typical code change is 100 lines. A rough factor is uh, 100 lines in 100 lines in within dev nodes, also within, within method definitions. We have 300 mutations. Um, you, you select maybe 50 to 80 tests for that. Um, Typically, mutant mutation testing, even unoptimized, is faster than your integration test because you run it concurrently in a separate task. And if you use the tool a little bit more professionally, you can, you, right now, um, I, I use it without concurrency. And if I, would, if I would spend the time to set up concurrency, which also would make the workshop participants harder because then we have to figure out MySQL. Actually, right now, I would go for Docker because it's more stable. But when I made the workshop, it wasn't the case. Um, um, you would get around locally around four to four to six times the speed on CI. Typically, you have two cores, so you get double the speed. That plus incremental mode typically makes mutation testing finish faster than your integration tests. And on the extreme side of things, I can also demonstrate what happens. So there is. So 
this is uh, this is basically um, this is uh, um, a class which only has in-memory tests, doesn't touch the database, can use full concurrency, and we we have gone through uh, one thousand mutations in six point four seconds. So that's that's the other side of the thing. So as the more mature your test really we get, yes, exactly. So it is basically fat, and this is not even the full version because the latest release, yeah, on the latest release, so. Probably was on the other machine. So normally I get normally I get 250 mutations, but this is the this is the machine with eight cores. Uh, uh, the, uh, but that's a Ryzen mobile. Trend. So this is um, this is a Core i7, an old one, like three years ago. And I've got a Ryzen 25 watt Ryzen mobile with eight cores that goes up to 250 mutations per second. So what you see with Zolidus is the is the worst case, and. Is worst case is still faster than a human. That's all I care about from in terms of governance. I want my teams to spare the human time to catch this domain violating bug or patch, or catch the security issue, or catch um, or catch the missing requirement. I do not want them to figure out if an HTML HTML safe um, method call is actually needed or not. This is beneath what humans regularly should spend their time on. So as, as long as it's faster than the human trying out the hypothesis, the code couldn't be reduced any further, I'm fine. But I see your point, and typically it's not an issue. If you only have integration specs, then you will have a hard time. But um, I've got a customer who boots like 50 EC2 instances and shards all integration tests against this. I, I think a run costs like $5, but they still think it's cheaper than human time. So fine, fine to support that use case. So it's uh, I can only propose it, and I really wish people would at least try it out and give me feedback because um, I'm I, I was working in a quite a Ruby niche where we had lots of time to think about making it really durable and going the extra mile all the time, and I think this tool could offer something for the average Ruby developer, but I need to find the right way to integrate with the workflows. And the more test projects I get where I can get fine-grained feedback. So the ideal client who wants to try this tool actually can get me access to their repo. And uh, each time they have a problem, they ping me on their commercial project. So I actually see what's going on and I can help fine-grained and extract the knowledge into making, into providing these kinds of missing features. I sometimes say, for example, uh, recently, they may, re may recently rates change to um, favorite uh, request test instead of controller test. So test selection against the string like, hey, get categories. Is, is not possible with stock mutant, but if you write a four line hook, it's possible because you just run it through the router, discover the, con the controller, and then you know what controller is covered by what tests. And stuff like that I would never discover because I do not do Ruby professionally anymore. Um, I see an interesting question. Um, there are other tools. So you could um, use the two year old open source mutant. So I didn't uh, prune the release and I do not intend to do so. Uh, your mileage will vary especially with newer syntax features. Um, there is Heckle, which is really old. It's at this point only a proof of concept. It has terrible test selection. So all the, all the things which made me write mutant in the first place, which, is, which was done for Data Mapper 2, um, which later turned into ROM, which I'm not related with. Um, uh, so with Heckle, you will not get any, any mileage on current projects. Um, for other languages, there are some other good tools. I can recommend PyTest for Java. Um, I can recommend MAL for um, LLVM-based languages, especially Rust. I can recommend Dextool for C. And um, I'm, I've never used personally used Striker for JavaScript. So there are other tools in other languages, but um, Mutant is one of the more production-ready mature ones. So uh, for Ruby, you don't have a choice right now. You ha would have to go with Mutant. Okay, yes, and this Discord is uh, my Discord, which was just posted to the Slack. I'm happy to buzz me there. Um, I got derailed by myself. Uh, I got myself derailed on answering the question about alternatives. Um, can somebody remind me where I was before? You okay. Are, oh, okay. yeah. I, I never went back to my slides. So because there was a live coding slide and there are two slides following, maybe I should finish them. Um, so the consequences 
of mutant I've already hinted a lot is that the fact that you can replace parts of a human review, and I emphasize only parts, there's no silver bullet, I would never claim it even finds bugs, it just finds wiggle room between tests and code, nothing more, nothing less. And uh, you see lots of mutation testing engines in the public being sold like, yeah, is this a tool to take bugs in your test? No, they don't. It's just, this is misleading marketing. It doesn't do the technique any favor. And it's also not watch, watches your watchman because it only watches difference in behavior between test and code, nothing more, nothing less. And the nice thing is if you can do 20% or even 30% of a code review locally <laughs> on yourself and running these kinds of tools, must not be mutant, also look for other languages, you, you, fix lots of time usage. You use your time more efficiently and you increase the chance that your contribution is above the earlier mentioned contribution threshold. Yeah, then there's the typical marketing stuff. Here, uh, that's slide, uh, you can find everything, all the relevant links.